Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates. Uh, my call is W4DD. I've been in uh, Georgia here north of Atlanta for about 25 years now. Uh, I grew up in Michigan in the cold climate with lots of snow. Spent about 15 years in uh, Virginia working air defense uh, communications and then eventually moved into wireless down in, uh, in this uh, area of the country. The, uh, the winters are better, although this winter has been terribly rainy and I'm getting really tired of the rain. It uh, seems like every other day we're getting an inch of rain and I've had enough. So uh, the good th news is it keeps the noise level down. So tonight I'll be talking about uh, my experience with locating power line noise and uh, other kinds of RFI. Uh, like I mentioned, if you uh, have a question, short question, just, just hop in there and, and stop me. So we'll be talking about what is RFI, do you have it? Uh, some tools, simple tools, and then also much better tools for locating the RFI, some examples, and some clearing distance guidelines, how far out you should look for the RFI, and then uh, some results, uh, what I was before I started this work about 15 years ago and what it looks like today. So what is RFI? RFI is an acronym, Radio Frequency Interference, a very broad general term. Uh, <clears throat> bad news is it raises the noise floor, or the received noise floor, and the higher the noise floor, the fl fewer signals you can hear. When the noise floor is low, even weak signals are going to sound really good. Uh, many types of devices, just about anything that plugs into the wall can generate uh, noise uh, to uh, varying levels. Power lines and switching mode power supply are the two most common, and usually two most severe also. Not unusual to have multiple devices in a home creating RFI. You want to limit uh, devices that are really bad. So one uh, subsection of RFI is power line noise, PLN. Uh, it's a very high energy uh, signal generated by high voltage arcing. And it's like a spark gap transmitter from 100 years ago. Very wide band, can be very intense if the arc is big enough. The effectiveness is determined by the intensity of the arc and also the antenna, in this case, the power lines connected to it. It can be from very minimal to 20, 30, 40 dB over S9. Lots of causes for power line noise. Um, three most common defective insulators, defective lightning arresters, and metal to metal arcing on the pole. One characteristic PLN is usually wideband. It goes all the way from the AM broadcast band through VHF and into UHF. Another a common source of uh, RFI is switching mode power supplies. Uh, very common uh, for powering all kinds of things nowadays, pretty much the dominant uh, power supply for devices that you can identify them because they're usually very small and lightweight. They only weigh a few ounces as compared to the old linear types that weighed maybe a half a pound or a pound. They generally plug into the wall, take one outlet. They use a small transformer that uh, uh, oscillates at 15 to 50 kilohertz. Uh, that's quite a bit higher than the standard 60 hertz power line, and therefore they can make the transformer more efficient and make it smaller. Uh, if not well designed, they can generate a lot of noise, especially on the lower bands. So why do we care about the noise floor? I, I took a couple of snapshots, so uh, just a couple minutes apart. And the first one is 40 meters. I had an S7 noise floor. I looked at about 100 kilohertz of bandwidth. I counted 11 workable stations. Stations, I could see the signal pretty clearly and pretty sure I could work them. A few minutes later, later the noise went away. Um, still 40 meters, same slice and the noise floor was now S5, I could count 17 workable stations. So just by changing the noise floor by two S units, <clears throat> I could see 50% more stations. And I'd probably say that's pretty typical. If you lower the noise floor two S units, you see a lot more stations and, and you, can, you can hear them, you can work them usually. That's the, the hard part. So we definitely, as amateur radio operators, care about the noise floor. So do you have RFI? You power up your, your HF radio, you pick the band you want to, find an unused frequency, flip over to AM mode uh, in the six kilohertz filter normally flips in. And what you should hear is a nice gentle um, hissing sound. And if you don't hear that, if you hear something else that sounds like a raw buzzing or something artificial, you're gonna have to investigate a little more, but there's a good chance you have some kind of uh, receive interference. 
So here's an example of what power line noise sounds like. And as you can kind of tell, there's uh, some variation in it. It's not a usually a constant kind of thing. There's there's usually some uh, some variation in it. And if you were to look at this on an oscilloscope, and I have many times, you'll you know, compare it to a sine wave coming off the AC power line in your home. What you'd see is uh, a very sharp spike at the peaks of the AC sine wave. Sometimes there's only one spike per half cycle. Sometimes there's more than one spike per half cycle. So it could actually be firing more than once on each AC sine wave. That's kind of interesting and one of the characteristics you can use to identify uh, power line noise. It's, it's always in sync with the uh, 60 Hertz in your house though. So one of the questions I, I usually ask people to investigate when they complain about power line noise is what bands are affected? Go down the five common bands. What's the S meter reading? What's the antenna used? Kind of gives you an overview of, yeah, is it worse at, uh, at 80 meters or is it about the same all the way up through 10 meters? And the second step, if you have a directional antenna, I usually go every 30 degrees and take an S meter reading and kind of divide the, uh, the circle into quadrants. So I have like a Northeast quadrant, Southeast quadrant, uh, Northwest, uh, Southwest. So I can narrow down where I have to look. That's a whole lot easier than looking across all 360 degrees uh, uh, from your, your QTH. You can narrow it down, you know, where is the worst uh, noise coming from? So a lot of times I'll drive the, the Southeast quadrant out to maybe a mile or so and map it out and kind of figure out what's going on. The, uh, the better antenna you have, by the way, like if you have a two element, you can kind of get an idea what quadrants in pretty well. If you have a three, four, five element or a seven element Yagi, you can really get a very precise vector and put that on a map and really you know, get a good idea where that noise is uh, coming from. And it's usually going to be where uh, that vector crosses roads because typically power lines uh, follow roads. So you can use that to your advantage if you have a multi-element uh, Yagi. So some simple tools and techniques for finding uh, noise. Uh, probably one of the simplest circuit breaker test. You go uh, into your circuit breaker panel for your house, turn off all the breakers. Did the noise go down? If the noise did not go down, there's no sense in looking inside your house any farther. And of course, make sure you have any uninterruptible power supplies uh, disabled because they could continue to run. But if the noise level did not change, that kind of clears your house. Uh, if the noise level did change, then you go back and turn each circuit breaker on and then off, cycle through all the breakers, find out where it is. And you want to turn it off because sometimes noise is cumulative. One noise source on a breaker may mask another uh, breaker's noise. So each time you turn one on, take a S meter reading, turn it off again. Uh, second uh, simple tool, portable AM radio. Uh, you can use that, walk around the house and kind of give an idea of, of what rooms are noisy. I've done that a number of times and it's not precise enough for me. I mean, I, I can find switching mode power supplies pretty easily, but I also have some house wiring that's noisy and that hasn't been very fruitful in trying to find out exactly where that's coming from. The circuit breaker test actually works better. And then the third thing is AM car radio. You can drive around using the AM radio, listen for the noise. Uh, that's pretty effective. I kind of have my radio and my truck calibrated. I know when the radio blanks, it's a significant noise source. So these are really simple things anybody can do without any uh, special tools. One thing to keep in mind, the noise could always be something small, close to your antenna, or it could be something uh, quite far away and a much stronger noise source. And you really don't know that until you, you do some investigating. So uh, here are some better tools. And these are the ones I use most often, these, these three tools. Uh, I use 137 megahertz Yagi, an HT and a 45 dB attenuator. It's really a, a very useful tool. I use it all the time. I never go out and do any uh, RFI hunting without that tool. It's just uh, 
really it's like the crescent wrench of tools for rfi hunting and i find uh, vhf works best the antennas aren't too big but i can still hear noise yeah maybe a quarter mile or even up to half mile away uh second most useful tool is i have an ultrasonic dish that's useful for finding the hardware on a pole that's defective it listens not in rf but in the audio range and it's it's pretty precise i can usually locate uh, the source down to a few inches and the third tool I use is something called RFI Mapper. Um, I use it to, to when I want to get a kind of a, a very wide area noise, WAN, to, to borrow a term from the IT world, view of what's going on because I can cover a lot of road miles, like 10 miles pretty easily in a drive. And I can bring that home, put it on a map and tell exactly where that noise is. And we'll look at examples of each, each one of these. So the first uh, item is my uh, VHF Yagi, uh, really a great tool. I have an old uh, Yesu VX5 I use, uh, been around forever. Uh, it's really essential tool if you want to find noise one at a time, which is usually adequate for, for most cases. And also if you're gonna assist the power company, you really want something like this so you can point at the pole and they can listen to it. You point at one pole and it's, it's quiet. You flip it over the other pole and it's just uh, screaming loud it's really a good convincer for the line crews and you need to build credibility with the line crews when you're out there. Uh, you, you don't want to uh, appear like you don't know what you're doing. You want to appear like, yeah, I know what I'm doing and that's the pole right there. It's on that pole. Uh, and in my case, I built this, uh, it was called a prototype at the time. This is about 15 years or so ago. And I had meant to rebuild it to make it look better, but it just works so good. I just leave it as is and it just plays fantastic. O3 Element Yagi is a great antenna, whether it's an HF or VHF. And it's simply built out of a broomstick that I had uh, laying in the garage at the time, uh, the handle for the, the broom, and then some 10-3 uh, uh, solid conductor house wire. So it didn't cost me anything. Uh, the attenuator is just a rebuilt uh, cable TV attenuator that didn't work. It had the cutouts for the slide switches. And it's nothing more than four slide switches and uh, I think it's 12 resistors inside that box and that's it. And it works really well too, up to 45 dB. And I have plans for this if you wanna build these things or they're kind of like evening projects, pretty uh, quick to go together. So a question I frequently get is why use 137 megahertz? And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is, uh, AM works best for finding noise. You can hear the characteristics of the noise so much better. And some of the HTs only do AM in the aircraft band. So you have to be in that 108 to 137 band for it to enable AM mode. Uh, the other thing is HTs will not transmit in the aircraft band. So that attenuator with the tiny quarter watt resistors will not start to smoke um, if you actually uh, hit the, accidentally hit the PTT button on the, uh, the handy talkie. Uh, I, I kind of got a little concerned that, hey, I have this, uh, this uh, attenuator antenna HT, and if I'm out with my power line guy, something noise, and I actually uh, accidentally hit that PTT button and smoke the attenuator, that would not be a very convincing evidence for the, the power line guys to watch smoke come out of my attenuator. So I thought, well, I want to prevent that at all costs. I want to make sure that's, that can't possibly happen. And you know, you look much better when you don't uh, smoke your test equipment. I find uh, the VHF band provides good range and good pole resolution. I can easily narrow down to the pole, yet I can hear poles that are quarter mile, even a half mile away if, if they're really loud to have a bad uh, lightning arrestor. And there's usually a couple of quiet frequencies at the top of that band around 136, and they work pretty well. A few hints for using the HT Yagi. I'd say it's a must have if you're gonna work with a power company in the field. It uh, provides confirmation what pole they should be working on. Noise loudness is not very indicative of the RF level. And when I first started, I did not have the attenuator and sometimes things sound really loud, but you find out, no, it's really only a six dB noise. So that influences where you wanna look. You should always go by the RF level, not how the noise sounds. Uh, so the attenuator is, is really a necessity, in, in my opinion. You can start without it, but you definitely need to add it. And one of the things I do is I rate my noise. Uh, if it's in the zero to 12 dB, in other words, if I have to flip in 12 dB 
to silence the noise and go back to just the hiss of the you know, background noise from the HT. That's kind of a small noise. It has to be pretty close to my house to be uh, any kind of a problem. If it's a 13 to 24, I call that a medium. That's getting up into, I'm a little more concerned about a range. Uh, if it's a 25 to 40, that's a big noise source. And if it's above 40 dB to quiet it, uh, that's really a monster noise source. And if it's anywhere near your house, it's gonna be a problem. One of the things to consider uh, poles with lots of high voltage lines on them, they seem to be the cause of noise, but it could be an adjacent uh, pole with just one high voltage wire on it. And think of it like the wires are antennas, right? So if a pole has a lot of wire on it, it may be the stronger radiator, but it may not be the real culprit. So what I do is when I'm deciding what pole, this is the case for power line noise, what pole is causing the noise, I always stand midway between two poles and do an AB comparison. And uh, I had an uh, interesting experience. Uh, this is probably five years or so ago. I was out with my power line guy. We uh, chased a, a problem through a neighborhood and I said, well, it's that way. And that way was across the creek. And we had to circle around and go about a mile out of our way to get to the subdivision. And then in my eagerness, I jumped out of my uh, truck with my Yagi and did a couple comparisons and says that Vic, it's, it's this pole here. And he went over and he had his ultrasonic and usually we kind of split the duties. I do the RF side and he does the uh, ultrasonic side and he scanned the pole. And I knew when he smiled, uh, I was kind of in trouble because we have a pretty good working relationship. And if, if I don't uh, identify the right pole, he, he kind of enjoys that once in a while. So anyway, he scanned the pole, he smiled a little bit. I thought, uh oh, and then I noticed that there was the, the high voltage line was leading down a driveway to a transformer next to a, a person's garage. So he walked down that driveway, scanned the pole and says, no, it's this pole, Jeff, uh, next to the uh, garage. So uh, that's a good uh, uh, lesson I had to relearn for maybe the 20th time that you always stand between two poles. And if there's poles beyond the pole you suspect, you go beyond that pole, do the AB test. And if there's any, um, drop poles that come off of that pole going down to a, you know, a road or something like that, you need to go down halfway between those two poles and do the AB comparison. That's the only fair way to determine what pole it is. Fortunately, I haven't made that uh, error in the last uh, several years, so I must be getting a little better. Second uh, very common thing um, that I use a lot on power line noise is the ultrasonic dish. Here's the one I built. It's a 18 inch uh, precision uh, dish. Uh, in this case, it was aluminum. I painted it to be more of an equipment uh, gray. And I use it when I have to go out alone. Typically, if I go out with a power company, he's going to handle the ultrasonic aspect with his dish. And I'll do the RF side because since I'm better at RF and he's probably better at uh, ultrasonic. But uh, it comes in really handy when I go out alone because I can identify the pole but I can also identify the part on the pole and I can report back with a picture. And I don't think I have any in this presentation, but I usually provide a, a, a kind of a close up at the top of the pole and I circle the bad part and say, it's, it's this uh, bell insulator and it's the joint between the second and third part of the bell. You can identify it to that level of uh, precision. Uh, in my case, I wasn't really happy with the little peep through hole that the initial uh, design provided. So I added a 1X scope to mine also a handle and a mount for the electronics. I find that uh, that 1X scope really helps a lot. Um, it, the, the beam width of the dish is about plus or minus six inches. So by scanning left to right and up down, uh, you can usually resolve to within a few inches. So if it's a staple on a pole at the top of the pole, I can usually resolve that pretty well. And I can take a picture with my cell phone. And when I get back, I can enlarge it and you can actually see the staples uh, where they're stapling the ground wire and it uh, works pretty well. It's one of the things I try and do when working with a power company. I try and save them time and really narrow it down and say, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident, 95% confident it is whatever, the bell insulator or, or the arrestor or whatever it happens to be. My uh, power line guy and I go back oh, maybe 10 years or so now. And uh, usually now when I report something, I'll, I'll take a picture like this and I'll circle the bad component on it and uh, he sends me a message back, says, yeah, I got your email, I'll go out and investigate it. 
I think much of the time now he doesn't even go out anymore. He just writes a trouble ticket on it, turns it over to the line crew, and they come out and replace that part. But we have enough rapport that you know, when I report something, um, it's fixed if the line crew isn't too busy within 24 hours or so. So here's what uh, power pole hardware looks like. When I first started this, I was a little uh, mystified by what was going on. But the very top, um, we have a high voltage line. In this case, it's just a single phase. It's not a three phase system with three high voltage lines. There's a pole top insulator that's held up by a bracket. And then on the right hand side, um, you have a tap coming off that goes to a black um, cylinder with fins on it. That's a lightning arrestor. And then it jumps over to this gray thing that supports a white thing. And the white thing with this hook on it is a fuse. And they can pull that fuse out and open up the circuit. In this case, that uh, fuse is feeding a wire that comes over to a bell insulator on the left-hand side of the pole that feeds a house that's uh, uh, maybe 150 feet or so away. So this is pretty common arrangement for a pole. Uh, if you have three phases, you might have three times as much stuff. And just to give you an idea, I have a couple of these items here I'm going to show you. So here's a, a picture of the, uh, the bell insulator, and it's a heck of an insulator. These things are about seven pounds or so. This one's in good shape. It's, uh, it's pretty good. It's got a slot in the top. The high voltage line lays in that slot. And then they have a wrap wire that goes around the, the in and out of that wire, and it wraps around this groove in the pole top. And sometimes it's the pole top insulator, sometimes it's the wrap wire. This is a really a, a heavy duty insulator. This, this thing is heavy. And it takes a lot to blow these apart, but lightning will sometimes actually penetrate these. And I've seen holes punched in them uh, right through the porcelain. And that porcelain is probably uh, a good two inches thick. And the other thing I was gonna show you was what a, a lightning arrestor looks like. This is the new style. These are rubber fins. Uh, that uh, provide the isolation between the high voltage side and the ground side. This is a new style and it's rubber coated. The old style is a porcelain type. And the old style, um, because it was a hard surface, you could take an ultrasonic dish and you could uh, easily find those things. I mean, if you were within, I don't know, 50 or 100 yards of those things and you pointed the dish at the uh, old style, you would hear it. It'd be just blasting like crazy because it's a, a very good uh, transfer of sound through the uh, through the arrestor. And inside this arrestor are hockey pucks, basically, of MOVs. And they're stacked all together to make the proper voltage for the lightning arrestor. So these new ones are rubber. They're very hard to hear uh, arcing through unless it's really severe stuff. So I've had a few cases where um, we've not been able to identify what's going on in the pole. And we've worked with the uh, line crew and had them drop uh, each one of these offline for the uh, various parts of the pole, the phases, and that's how we've had to find them. Sometimes I can shoot from the very bottom of the arrestor and get a vibration off the bolt on the bottom with the dish, but other times it's kind of a pain in the butt to, to do it, but uh, uh, you have to work through it. So just kind of keep that in mind. So let me go back to sharing the screen here. There we go. So uh, power pole hardware, and there's other stuff on poles too, like uh, cable TV and, uh, and, and telco stuff. But uh, the things I typically see that are issues are lightning arresters, extremely noisy. They'll produce uh, uh, RFI that is uh, well above 45 dB, which is the limit of my attenuator, sometimes uh, 60 dB worth of attenuation to eliminate the noise. And that's because they're sitting between the high voltage and ground. So when you have an internal arc on an arrestor, it's usually very intense. Pole tops and bell insulators are a little less so. They're many times in the 20, 30 dB range, 35 dB range. And that's just a, a very general rule. One word of warning, never touch power pole hardware. As a RF guy, your objective is to observe, but not touch. Uh, you never know when there's a fault on one of these uh, lines, like even the ground line, maybe it really isn't at ground level. Maybe there's corrosion at one end and that thing is energized. So uh, it reminds me of uh, back in a double E school, the instructor would give you a, a black box. And you said, tell me what's inside the black box. That's gonna be your grade. And you'd have to identify what is inside that box by just doing testing on the box, but not actually opening up the box to see what was inside. 
And that's your objective here is you can look all you want, but you can't touch. So when you do find a problem, what do you do? Uh, well, you call up to your local EMC and uh, ask them to open a trouble ticket. Sometimes the person you talk to, the customer rep is familiar with uh, how to do that. Sometimes it's a little more of a challenge. And I've seen both of those cases. Uh, what I try and do is establish contact with the person responsible, either the engineer or the, uh, the uh, line crew chief and start a conversation with him, send them pictures, uh, the picture of the kind of like the map uh, with the area circled, the pole circled, um, and then the part on the pole circled. So I kind of work them down. And, you know, the first encounter may not go real smooth, but uh, it's kind of our job to build up uh, credibility. What I usually do, and I've seen this quite a few times, is usually when I get involved in this kind of stuff, the problem is not simple. There's multiple things going on. There might be six different poles in the area and you have to kind of say what are the most important ones and then pick those worst two or three poles to uh, work with the power company on and usually start closest to the person's house and kind of work your way out you don't want to give them 20 things to chase they're going to they're going to blow you off and you're not going to get anywhere uh, the way i view it is we as hams are the rf experts we know rf uh, to a much greater depth than the power company guys do and i'll give you an example a power company guy will see a ground line and we know as hams that a vertical a wire that's 40 feet long can be a really good radiator even though it's grounded at one end to a power line guy that wire cannot radiate because it's grounded at one end and, and that's true at 60 hertz but we're not working at 60 hertz right we're working at uh, 7 megahertz or 14 megahertz so we understand the rf it's our uh, kind of job to get them to the right pole using RF techniques. And it's their job to find out what's wrong with that pole. And you don't want to find every noisy pole in your city. In your city, you're going to be working on thousands of poles if that's the case, and they're going to eventually abandon the, the search. But uh, if you approach it you know, with them in a reasonable manner, uh, show them your evidence, uh, it usually works out pretty well and you establish some rapport with the power company and the line crews. You always want to offer to be on site. Sometimes they take you up on that. Sometimes they don't, but I find it very handy. If I can listen while they're doing something on the pole, listen to safe distance, you know, maybe hundred feet away. Uh, and they can also hear your handy talk if you have this, this speaker on and as they're probing the pole, they may get to a point on that pole where they touch something and the noise totally goes away or changes. And that's very handy to, uh, to have. Uh, over time, you're going to build uh, credibility with your power company and uh, things start to usually uh, go better and better. I find that EMCs have been really uh, great to work with here in Georgia and, and even in uh, other uh, places to Texas, uh, Virginia. It's just a matter of finding the right guy and, and helping that person as much as you can to, uh, to resolve the problem and get it done efficiently without spending days with uh, line crews dispatched. So the third tool I use is something called RFI Mapper. Uh, here's an example of one of the maps I did and these little green dots are uh, readings, uh, S-meter readings. And I plotted these with a tool called Google My Maps. And I ran this route to, uh, three or four years ago and you can see there's a couple of hot spots here that identified some problems and we'll talk about those. So why did I need a new tool? Well, I had about 10 years of power line noise and sometimes they were big, sometimes small, sometimes they were intermittent, sometimes constant. I was out at 20 degree uh, temperatures with uh, 25 or 30 mile an hour winds and it's colder to heck when you have to walk the neighborhood doing that, especially if you have to walk a mile or so. Um, the HF beam gave me a general direction, but it wasn't very precise. It wasn't precise enough. Uh, very tedious doing all that walking and sometimes not too often but sometimes the vhf noise doesn't correspond with the hf noise that's especially true with the oddball problems like uh, uh, switching mode power supplies or dsl problems or something like that so after about five years of work i just never could get my noise under control for any length of time just there were too many sources over too large an area i'd get one problem solved it'd be good for a few weeks or a month and then something else would pop up and I'd have to call them back out. And they were fixing these things onesie twosies where they'd come out and fix one thing and then they'd leave and I'd have to call them back. 
And then the final straw was I had a S9 plus 10 noise to the southeast. And I had a second noise source, an S6 to the west that I could not locate. So back in 2015, I was really getting rather frustrated. I needed a, a kind of approach, different approach to the problem. And that's usually my solution to the problem. If I can't solve it, I go, I'm doing this wrong. Or, you know, I must need to do something else to solve it. So about Christmas time in 2015, I bought a GPS and started writing some uh, beta code uh, in Visual Basic to collect S meter data. So what I ended up with was uh, something I call RFI mapper. It's a color coded map, shows the location and the signal strength, uh, S meter reading the noise. I, I pick the band, I usually use 10 meters for power line noise. I get pretty good uh, resolution there. Can usually identify down to the pole or at least within one pole of where the noise is. And uh, it, uh, my, my power line guy went out and when I sent him, I used to send him a map and I did it before I had a dish and just say it's in this area He'd go out and say, yeah, it was one pole up from that pole you identified. So that's maybe 150 feet or so. As I uh, drive around, uh, the laptop records the S meter level every second, and it announces the uh, level every 10 seconds, and also any level above S9. So if it goes above S9, it'll start going, you know, S10, S11, S12. And if it doesn't find any noise above S9, it just gives me an announcement to know, so I know it's still running every 10 seconds. I can then go out and confirm the poll with the uh, HT and the dish. Uh, I like the map because it really shows the power company, hey, the guy's not making this up. This is real data. And uh, I can also send a map after it's all done. And if the map is green, uh, that's good. They, they, they like that, of course. They fix the problem and the customer's happy. So we'll look at some examples. Here's uh, the scale I use, and I've extended the S uh, meter scale above S9, even though we know it doesn't go higher than that, but it makes it convenient to uh, quantize the noise. So S10 is a S9 plus 6 dB, and so on all the way up to uh, S13 or S14. The color coding I use is I use the cold colors like green to indicate things are good, then into yellow, orange, red, and eventually uh, white and black. And if it's really high level, like this was an S13, I had one sample at S13, uh, I use a black star. Uh, if I run out of colors, <laughs> I have to adjust the scale. That's happened a few times where I got to the top and I still had a lot of noise sources to map, but generally this works uh, pretty well. Anything above an S9, I, I look at real seriously because it could be a pretty big problem. And anything above an S11 is really a red flag like, Unless this is really far away, but behind a hill, it's going to be a problem for me. So here's the first example we're going to look at. And it's the one that kind of motivated me to make RFI Mapper. My QTH is in the upper left hand corner, in the very upper left hand corner, uh, 1.7 miles away from the final uh, source of the noise. And I spent days with the power line guy up in the upper left hand corner of this map. There's Quite a bit of distance not shown here. But you can see there's some noise up there. There's an orange and a yellow. And we were, you know, walking around with the Yagi and Dish and we were finding noise and they were having the line crew come out and fix the you know, noise. And it just wasn't getting me anywhere. I, I could never get the noise down below that uh, 10 or 20 over S9. And I finally said, okay, this isn't working. I'm spending days and even weeks trying to track this stuff down. So that's when I wrote wrote the beta code. It was pretty crude at the time. Uh, and I just says, I am going to collect S meter data and I'm just gonna keep on collecting it until I run into Lake Lanier, which is my su Southern boundary uh, and just be dumb and just collect a bunch of data and see where it points me. I'm not gonna try and interpret the data. I'm just gonna collect it to see, does this provide any clues of what's going on? So you can see, the route I drove, I have some green areas here that were looking pretty good. I eventually went down this road to the south, and then I came to the end of this road, <clears throat> and my wife was with me. We got to the end of this uh, this main trail here. I think it's called Sourwood. Um, even she said, this is where the problem is, isn't it? And that, that laptop was just going nuts. I mean, it was just saying S13, S12, S13, and it was at the very end of that road. Kind of interesting. Um, also, you see some stars here to the right that are pretty big noise sources. Once I cleared the primary noise source, I never heard those noise sources. They're behind a, the ridge line. The ridge line peaks to the, the main route here, 
and I don't even hear those noise sources. So dirt is really a good attenuator. You know, if you can put dirt between you and the noise source, that's always a good thing. And of course, if you have a really tall tower, you know, 100 feet or 150 feet, there's less dirt to uh, serve as the attenuator, so to speak, and you can hear noise sources uh, quite far away. So in this case, what was the cause? It was a bolt. This bolt held up a cross arm on that pole and there was a metal plate near that bolt. The two came in close proximity and the bolt was arcing to the metal plate. And when the lineman got up near uh, the problem with uh, his bucket, he said, I could smell something burning up there. I knew something was wrong. The, the creosole or whatever they use for preservative was, uh, was uh, burning. And uh, so they pulled the bolt out, they redrilled the cross arm, put a new uh, bolt in farther away from the metal plate, and my noise level dropped to an S3. So we eventually found the problem. It just took us a little while to get there, a, a long while to get there. Oops. So the second uh, case is I drove a route for a um, power line guy, my, my uh, uh, associate I work with quite a bit at the power company. He asked me to look at an area that he was having problems with. And there were three hot spots uh, on the route I drove. And we're going to look at the one where I drove into this area where these blue stars, stars are. So coming uh, south uh, from top to bottom on this picture, you can see the level increased. I had a red, then I had a blue star, and then uh, red and an orange, and it tapered off. <clears throat> when I drove out of the neighborhood, same kind of thing. I had one blue star and between the blue stars were the pole, which I suspected to be the problem. Went out with the Yagi and said, yep, it's that pole. Went out with a dish and uh, it was a, a pole top insulator that was bad. So they replaced that and it got quiet. Sometimes when you have simple cases like this where the power line just follows the road, it really gets uh, simple to, to look at it and say, yeah, it's just, this is pole. It's, it becomes obvious. The uh, Example number three is uh, uh, I'd kind of gotten the noise settled down pretty good. And then all of a sudden, after a thunderstorm, it, it popped up again uh, severely to the southwest, maybe about a mile, I think, from my home, 1.3 miles, and drove this route. And it was just terribly noisy around this middle school. Even the side road was, was terribly noisy. It was, you know, like S12 uh, on the side road. But the peak was right in front of the middle school. So I, I came back with the Yagi, the dish, and uh, did the AB tests with the Yagi and found the pole right at the entrance to the middle school was causing problems. So I got the dish out, did the scan, and go, boy, that lightning arrestor is just blaring like crazy. So it was a pretty easy one to find. Interesting thing was, while I was out there with the Yagi, the, uh, there was a police officer that mans the middle school, and I was out there on a Tuesday doing this Tuesday morning. He came out and and I kind of knew I was <laughs> in trouble when he, he started walking towards me. He says, uh, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm trying to locate uh, some uh, power line noise. I live a mile away in, a, in an adjacent subdivision, and it's led me to this pole. And he gave me kind of a blank stare. And then he said, is this why my handy talkie doesn't work when I'm out directing traffic? And I said, yes, sir. That's exactly the case. I says, this thing is so strong. It's just overwhelming my receiver, even a mile away. And he says, oh, OK. And he turned around and left, and away he went, and he was quite happy. So you just never know who you're going to run into. And I've probably run into three or four officers over the years that uh, have asked me what I'm doing. And almost all the time, they have some interesting comment, like one person says, oh, yeah, this is uh, how ankle bracelets work and how we track people with ankle bracelets. And I said, yep, in a very similar way. You have a Yagi antenna, you point it and, and track it down. So um, it, uh, you run into some really interesting uh, people and they usually just want to know what you're doing and uh, you explain it to them. And sometimes uh, their interests are your interests. And that's true for uh, cable DV problems sometimes too. Uh, noise generated by power lines can actually get into the cable t TV uh, system and uh, knock it totally off the air in that uh, section of the distribution. Okay, everybody's pretty quiet. Can you still hear me okay? Yep, we're still here. All right. And the last example we'll look at is uh, an area that was nice and quiet um, until June of 2018. 
and uh, things got noisy to the, to the southwest, drove the route, pointed me to this area near uh, Dollar General. There was a couple of poles on the, on the corner. And uh, this took, a, I think, a total of three trips for the power company to resolve. Uh, at first, it looked like it was the pole top insulators. They were generating noise. We replaced those. Noise didn't go, to, go away. And they came back and uh, replaced a recloser, which is like a circuit breaker that it'll make, uh, I think, three attempts to reclose. And if the overload is still there, it just cycles offline. But that was kind of a nasty one. Um, Apparently they had a lightning strike in this area and it damaged some equipment. It was more than just one piece of equipment, but uh, it was pretty clear where it was coming from. You can see the, the hot spots with the, the black circles, white circles, and the, the black star right there in the corner. So a quick overview of RFI Mapper. Um, it, it's really kind of a WAN tool, wide area network. When you have to collect a lot of data, that's the tool you wanna use when you wanna find an individual pole, that's not the tool you want to use. But uh, pretty simple, every uh, second uh, there's a GPS attached to the laptop, the GPS sends the lat long to the laptop, that'll cause the um, software to uh, read the S meter from the, the radio, and my radio is a really old Kenwood TS-690, but it uh, works really well, so I continue to use it. And it does this every one second, it collects a single data point. It writes the lat long, the S meter, and the elevation data to the hard drive. And I, sometimes elevation data comes in handy because you can spot poles on hills quite a distance away by looking at that elevation data. You can click on the dot, the, like the green dot or the black dot. It'll give you the lat long, the S meter, and the elevation point. So it does 60 samples every minute. If I drive for 30 minutes, I collect 1800 data samples. And in 30 minutes, that's if I'm driving 20 miles an hour, which is about, about average, I can collect 10 road miles of data. So I can really get a good picture of a quadrant like this Southeast quadrant or the Northeast quadrant. I can drive 10 road miles, drive all the, the troublesome roads and within about 30 minutes of mapping or 30 minutes of data collection, and then maybe about another 15 minutes of uh, mapping it, um, I can get a pretty good idea of where I need to be focusing my attention. And that saves me a lot of walking. The mapping's done with something called Google My Maps, which is different than Google Maps. Really easy to learn. Once you learn it, you can map in within 10 minutes. Uh, you can save 10 layers of maps. So I actually have 10 runs of data uh, in any one time. And I just start deleting the, the individual layers. And you can do about easily... Uh, 10 or so miles, maybe a little more for each one of the runs. Sometimes the runs are longer than uh, 30 minutes. I have to break it up into two pieces, but even that's not all that difficult to do. Hardest part, you need a mobile installation. You have to have uh, some kind of HF radio in the, uh, the mobile. I use it at old Kenwood 690. Uh, some people have used a K3 and that works pretty good too. And then uh, you have to install Microsoft Visual Studio development package, which isn't very difficult, really. It just takes a little time. <clears throat> what does the uh, architecture look like? Extremely simple. Laptop computer, first thing. Second thing is the HF transceiver. Third thing is the GPS. So really three components. And my HF transceiver is so old. Uh, some of you may remember TTL level logic, which is zero and five volts. That's going back like 30 or 40 years. I had to convert that to USB. So I use a, a TTL to RS-232 converter and then a, a RS-232 to USB converter to get it up to the, the laptop level so the laptop can talk to the radio. But that's just because of my the age of my transceiver. If you're using the K3, that has RS-232 right on it. So here's a, a sample of what it looked like when I first started. You can see why I had so many problems. Um, for my home QTH, I identified a one, two, three, four, five, six really bad areas within about a mile of my QTH. And that's a lot of walking to try and figure out where the problems are. But you can see that this identifies pretty well where the, the hot spots are. And, and keep in mind, I'm probably not the typical ham radio guy, I have a, a 90 foot tower and a five element 10 meter Yagi on it, which is pretty uh, directive. If you're 
working with a you know, three element Yagi and a 50 foot tower, the problems are a little different. You don't have to look out this far. I just had to go out this far to get my noise level down. And I was the first time in this area, I think. So there were problems from years that had built up. By August of 2018, here's what it looked like. And you can see this is a run I did with the middle school on it. You can see it's pretty dang quiet. I kind of solved most of the issues over a period of two years. And then these other two problems near the bottom were from a lightning strike that blew out some lightning arresters. They fixed those and that, that route is now green. So does RFI Mapper work? Yeah, it works pretty well. I've maybe mapped uh, over a thousand, 2000 PLN sources. You don't need to fix them all. You just need to decide what's really important to work on. And it's really a wide area noise tool. It's not a, you know, a, uh, it's not where you start. It's where you have to look if you have you know, some um, uh, pretty high gain antennas and a, a taller tower. So don't, don't think you need to build an RFI mapper to solve your problems. You don't. You really just need a, probably a Yagi to solve it. Uh, once the trouble's cleared, uh, you can always uh, uh, run a new map and you know, find out if it is green like you expected or did you not identify the right noise source. And most of the time you can, you can identify the right one the first pass. So after about 10 years of not making much progress, my uh, noise level went from well over S9 to about an S2. So it definitely helped me a lot. And it helped me to get to the point where I established some credibility with my, uh, my power company uh, folks. Right now I'm working mostly on intermittence during the summer, we get lightning strikes here in the Southeast. And it's not unusual to have you know, three, four lightning arresters blow out during the summer and I have to find those and, and get them fixed. So how far out do you need to look? Um, and here's kind of the general rules I use. If, if a ham has just wire antennas at you know, like 30 feet strung up in some trees, probably gonna have to clear out to about a quarter mile away to, to get the noise under control. Um, it's closer than that, you, you're gonna have to, uh, to solve it. And it depends a lot on the source too. A lightning arrestor, if it blows out, can easily be heard to a half mile away. Those things are really nasty. But generally speaking, if it's just a general uh, pole top, bell insulator, something like that, about a quarter mile. If you're running a three element beam at 50 feet, you have to start thinking uh, it could be a half mile away. And if you're running uh, a high gain antenna at 100 feet, I know some of the contest stations, you know, they're, they're 200 feet high and they have a stack of four antennas. They're gonna be able to hear noise out to multiple miles away they need to keep it under control and in all directions you know, they're trying to run you know high rates of qso's and you really can't tolerate uh, much noise uh, if not blocked by terrain i can usually hear noise sources out to well over a mile and it kind of depends on the intensity of the noise source so my longest confirmed noise source was that first one I showed you at 1.7 miles. It was kind of down a creek valley and it was S9 plus, even though it was 1.7 miles away. So extremely strong. And when I drove it, it was you know S13 on the RFI mapper. So you know, it was pretty hot. The longest suspect issue, I wasn't there the day they worked on it, but uh, identified a source at three miles away, uh, located on a hill, it was a lightning arrestor. I sent it over to my power line guy and he reminded me that I told him at one time, I can only hear out to about two miles as the max. I explained to him, well, that's generally true, but this case is kind of special. It's on a 200 foot hill. It's a lightning arrestor. The arrestor is extremely noisy. I said, I'm pretty sure it's this problem and it's, it is three miles away from me. I know that's a long ways to look, but he agreed to go out and, and uh, had the line crew replace it. And the afternoon they replaced it, the noise went away, totally disappeared. So I knew that was the right, uh, right thing. So what level, noise level is normal? And I compiled something from the ITU spec from a few years ago and also what I see, 80 meters, eh, about an S5 or S6 is what I typically see uh, band noise. And then on 14 megahertz, should be no more than an S4 on 28, no more than an S2. And ideally you'd like it about one S, you know, less than this, uh, but you, you want the noise you hear to be band noise, not something artificial created by something uh, humans are doing. 
One of the things that's really uh, valuable is uh, something called free space path loss, and it mathematically describes the loss you get over distance um, as the wave spreads out. And one of the things, uh, takeaways in this is the distance is a squared va variable. So if you cut the distance in half, the signal is going to go up by 6 dB. Or if you double the distance, it'll go down by 6 dB. And that's the reason why RFI mapper works. As you close the distance to the noise source, it gets louder and louder. And as you move away from it, it gets weaker and weaker. And in addition to mapping, that's also useful for your home installations too, because if you can move your antenna from um, above your roof line to the woods at the back of your house, you might be able to go from 50 feet to 100 feet or from 50 feet to 150 or 200 feet. That really helps reduce the noise uh, that you might be generating inside your house and it knocks it down one, two, three S units. So use that to your advantage if you can. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you're, you're limited um, as to where you can put your antennas, but anytime you can keep it away from your house and neighbors' houses, always a good thing to do. A few uh, notes on my internal noise sources I've discovered. First one I found rather quickly was in the router group. I have a cable modem, a router, and a VoIP. And the router was noisy. And uh, more specifically, the power supply, switching mode power supply for the router was very noisy. And it was forcing 10 or 80 meters to be an S7 or a little more. And I got that down to an S5 uh, on 80 meters uh, without too much trouble by adding some uh, ferrites to it. Uh, second thing, I had a Mr. Coffee LCD coffee pot. It was uh, measured to be a plus 18 with my Yagi walking around the house. It kind of gives me an idea how strong it is. And you can use the Yagi inside the house or outside on power poles. And I just keep it uh, unplugged when I, we're not using it. And then we also have a Dynex TV that's a little bit noisy. We just keep that unplugged unless we're using it. And so those are pretty simple fixes. Lessons learned. So uh, wall warts can be really noisy and they generally are really hard on the lower bands like 80 meters and 160. Uh, you can generally quiet them either by uh, replacing them if you can or using ferrites on the inputs and outputs. It's been pretty effective and we're gonna look at that in a second. If you have a cable modem and a router separate, one thing I discovered in my experiments was the router had a, uh, a switching mode power supply connected to it in 12 volts, uh, or maybe it was 19 volts coming in the back, but it does not have a connection to ground. It's just floating. There, uh, it had ethernet in and ethernet out, but that's not the same as a connection to ground. So what I ended up doing was I, I bought some CAT6 cables and I connected the cable modem, which had a ground because there's a grounding block for the cable modem as the cable enters the house. I, I used a shielded ethernet cable about three feet long to connect the cable modem to the router. And that knocked down the noise about an S unit. Very simple thing to do, um, but uh, it is definitely something to think about if you're operating two separate devices. Now, if it's an all in one device that really doesn't apply, but two separate devices. Something I discovered while doing that, and this is a, uh, comes in the category of shooting yourself in the foot. I, in my haste, ordered some RJ45s, shielded RJ45s uh, from one of the internet sites, got them in two days, arrived to put them in and it didn't work all that well. I was still getting noise. So I started measuring the resistance from the, the metal shell to the metal shell on the RJ45. And it was just jumping all around anywhere from a couple ohms to 20 ohms. And so I took one and I dissected it and the drain wire that provides the grounding for the shield was just laid next to the metal shell. It was no, not soldered, just laid next to it. And they were relying on compression to hold it against that metal shell and provide the ground. I said, oh, that's not good. So I went to Mouser, I ordered the Amphenol cables. They had a spec sheet and then they said uh, on a spec sheet, uh, soldered at both ends to the metal shell, which is what I wanted and uh, use those and they worked much better. So they knocked off about an S unit or so from the noise. So you get what you pay for, better to buy quality ethernet cables. I have not found it necessary to use shielded cable all the way to the PCs. 
um, once I grounded the, the, the uh, router uh, and put some uh, ferrites on the leads, uh, things got quiet and didn't have to do any extensive shielding of the cable runs in the house. So my 80 meter noise level went from an S5, or excuse me, from S7 to S5, just by doing a couple simple things once I figured out what I was doing. For quieting the switching mode power supplies, I used uh, ferrites uh, made by Fairrite. Uh, there's a website run by Jim Brown, K9YC. Fantastic website. I mean, you can spend uh, literally days reading about Jim's uh, experiences, his, his testing, design. And the bottom line is he has a list of uh, ferrites that he recommends, either the ones I use most common for HF stuff. And they're small, medium, large, and then you can also get the donut type. And you can see I applied them to the uh, switching mode power supplies, one for the router, one for the cable modem, and it just totally quieted up these, uh, these switching mode power supplies. Did a really good job. I have uh, always have a little stock of uh, ferrites and I store them in uh, reused Jif peanut butter containers. Works good, it keeps them from banging around and potentially getting cracked or damaged. And I have small, medium, and large, put a little part number on it, a little spec as to how much impedance. Um, one of the things you wanna do, I didn't men make mention of it, but I, I need to, is you wanna make multiple turns through the ferrites because it's a N squared uh, function. So it's N squared times the base impedance. So if you go through it one time, one squared is one. If you go through it two times, it's four times the base impedance. If you go through it three times, it's nine times the base impedance. So you can make three passes or maybe four passes through it. You're going to get a whole lot uh, better blocking of the RF uh, interference than if you can just make one pass through. Sometimes you're limited by the amount of cable you have but just remember it's an N squared function. So use that to your advantage if you can. So results uh, going back to uh, 2016, 2017, you can see what my noise level looked like on two days. The blue line is a, a good day. That was back in 2016 in September. And then the red line was a month later, the weather started getting cold and my noise level went way up and I had to do some research uh, and you can see it was way up in all directions not only to the east but even in to the west uh, two years later in august of 2018 the uh, target was i wanted to get down to s2 or less on 10 meters and you can see i did that the uh, red line was taken in 2018 in august and i was had a little bit of noise to the east a little bit of noise to uh, the southwest, but things were pretty good, really. It was uh, below S2 and usually around S1. So I was pretty happy. So to kind of summarize, uh, I view it as kind of a three-step process. The first thing you want to do is clear any local area noise LAN. And the easiest way to do that is a Yagi HT attenuator. Uh, pretty simple to do. Uh, the second thing uh, you want to do is uh, you want to identify the the pole with the Yagi. Um, and if possible, use your dish or the power company's dish and identify the part on the pole. So when they come out to replace, they can get right to that part and do it efficiently. And if you, after you clear the local area noise and you still have noise, then you have to look at the wide area noise and that might involve your AM car radio or uh, something like RFI mapper where you can you know, map a huge area depending on the kind of Yagis you have. If anybody would like a copy of the attenuator plans, uh, Yagi plans, just uh, drop me an email and I'd be glad to send those to you. I'll make one mention of uh, one thing on this slide. It is the third thing down on 10 meters. I had a noise. It sounded like a variable speed motor or a car engine running when I pointed towards my neighbor's house and he's about 250 feet away. Uh, our lots are pretty well sp uh, spread out here, but it was interesting because it would go tick, 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 just like a car engine was running. So from that, I assumed that, hey, this has got to be either a car engine, which it couldn't be because it was all the time, or it had to be a uh, variable speed motor on a AC unit. So I made arrangements with him. He was, he's always very cooperative and 
uh, we did a circuit breaker test and the breaker indicated it was in one of the upstairs rooms. The primary uh, use of the breaker was the bathroom. He went up and investigated and says, well, it appears to power the bathroom and the adjacent bedroom. I go, well, that's interesting. I thought it would be the, uh, your air conditioner, your heat pump. So he started uh, unplugging things in the room and he got to uh, his daughter uh, occupied that room and he unplugged a light string, a multicolored light string, which had a switching mode power supply and the noise went away. So I said, well, what did you do? He goes, well, I unplugged the power supply for the lights. I go, oh, what kind of lights are they? He goes, well, they're multicolored lights that go around the room. His daughter's, uh, I was in high school at the time. He says, but the lights weren't on. I go, that's interesting. He says, but it was still plugged in. So this is a case where the power supply was plugged in and it was doing some kind of regulation thing where it was changing the speed of, of how it was charging the, the uh, capacitors or something. And it was kind of oscillating all over the place. So it's exactly what I figured it was not. I would have never expected that from a variable or from a, from a uh, light string, not a variable speed motor. Um, so you can never tell about this kind of stuff. You just have to chase it to the source. And a lot of times you'll be surprised. It's not what you thought it was. It's something totally different. That's uh, another learning lesson for me. Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates.